The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, good afternoon. Welcome to the Partnership for Maternal and Child Health, uh, Essex Metro Immunization Coalition September meeting. Thank you so much for joining us today. We have a great agenda and great presenters um, on flu vaccine and flu prevention as we approach flu season this year. And I will introduce Dr. Joe Schwab from New Jersey, uh, Rutgers New Jersey Medical School. And he is also the chair of the Essex Metro Immunization Coalition to go ahead and introduce our first speaker today. Okay, thanks Emily. And I'd like to add my welcome to everybody who's able to join us uh, this afternoon for the um, webinar. Um, I'd like to welcome Dr. David Sinimo as our speaker this morning. He is an assistant professor in medicine and pediatrics at Rutgers New Jersey Medical School in the division of both adolescent and pediatric infectious diseases. He's an active and well-respected physician in the field of ID um, and has a clinical affiliation at University Hospital. Additionally, Dr. Sinimo is an associate program director for the Medicine and Pediatrics Residency Program, where he has a leadership role in training our future physicians. So we welcome him here today and are all happy that um, he's able to join us to share his insights on this timely topic of influenza vaccination. So welcome, Dr. Sinimo. Thank you, Dr. Schwab. Um, very nice introduction. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to say is I got my flu vaccine yesterday, so everybody should you know, run out and do that as soon as possible. And I hope by the end of this, you'll agree with that statement. Um, can we get the next slide? This is something that uh, some of you certainly will be anxious to write down um, and how to get credit. Uh, I'll, I'll decide, I'll let the uh, presenters decide how long this should stay up and um, then we can move on when you're ready. So today we're gonna be talking about influenza vaccine, but I don't actually think in the year 2020, you can talk about influenza vaccine or influenza in general without also touching on COVID-19. Um, so I, I hope by the end again, that you'll be able to successfully counsel your patients why this vaccine is important um, in, a, in a truthful, um, knowledge sharing way to get real informed consent and buy-in. Uh, and, and I think that part of one of our, part of our job is being able to teach and explain this to our patients in, in a truthful way. And I keep saying the word truthful because we'll talk a little bit about vaccine hesitancy and there's a lot of misinformation out there. My belief though, is you counter misinformation with true information, not your own brand of misinformation. And unfortunately, if you look through social media and some of the uh, vaccine um, literature that's being put out there, it's actually very difficult for some um, of our patients to figure out what is true and what is not true. Remember that if they're talking to you and they're asking you questions, it's because they do trust you and they do believe in you. And I'll show you some data that will suggest that the providers really are the trusted source of information. So please, let's keep being that. All right, so let's start. Next slide. You're listening to this uh, and you're getting some credits, but you're also listening because you know that influenza is a problem. Um, there's a significant burden of influenza every year. And these are just some graphics from the CDC. Some years are worse than others. Some years there are more or less sick people, but the estimates are between three and 11% of the US population contracts influenza every year. Now, unfortunately, unlike some other diseases, when you look at stats for influenza, they're all over the place. Um, if you look at that pyramid to the left of the screen, you know, look at the confidence interval between nine and 45 million people sick every year. And that's actually because influenza is often clinically diagnosed. It's not a reportable illness in most jurisdictions. And so we do have to estimate a lot. The top of the pyramid is 12 to 61,000 deaths. And of course, deaths are our major um, source of data because death certificates are generally coded properly. 
But I think COVID has taught us that this over-reliance in mortality as a statistic really misses the boat because the pyramid directly under that, the, the hospitalizations or the burden on the healthcare system is also very significant. So when we talk about effectiveness of flu vaccine in a few slides, let's not forget that making someone less sick is a very real benefit and something that we want to be able to talk to our patients about because it's not an all or nothing. When we look at the next slide, we have to talk about when is flu season. And this will come up because there are um, some data out there that say maybe we can get a flu vaccine too soon. Um, again, wait for a few slides, we'll, we'll see some of those data. But I think by and large, you'll see that there isn't really a too soon. Flu in the United States traditionally is a winter uh, illness. And this, again, is another chart from the CDC that shows that the most frequent month that contained the peak of flu season over the past, you know, over 20 years was February. <clears throat> Excuse me. But flu is very locally variable. And in general, flu starts on the West Coast, moves towards the East Coast. So we tend to be a later winter than our California colleagues, for instance. But you can really see flu move through a county, a city, a state at the granular level of detail day by day. Though There's a sharp peak and then it peters off. So one of the issues is just because it's most likely February doesn't mean that it is always February. And we have to be cognizant of that because we don't want people putting off their vaccine. Next slide. So mostly we're gonna talk about pediatrics here because I, I do love doing pediatrics um, and this is maternal child health. So from a pediatric focus, there is a misconception, I think, that the flu is not a big deal in kids. Um, it's actually a, a pretty unfortunate misconception because children are more likely to get ill, meaning medically attended illness from influenza than adults. You see the attack rate for children defined as age less than 17 is 9.3%, whereas adults, it's only 8.8%. Now, obviously these are very variable numbers. It really depends on the season, but the take home for this is flu is serious in children and especially those under the age of two years old. So the highest rates of complications are under the age of two, but there's still an appreciable risk under the age of five. Now, I, I use this statistic a lot for um, friends, colleagues, anybody that I have to talk about getting a flu vaccine, because they'll, they'll sometimes say to me, well, my kid's not in daycare, so they're not really exposed, so why do I need to bother? Um, you know, is this really going to help? And, and the truth is, yes, it is going to help, because we still don't want your three-year-old to contract influenza. Next slide. And we don't want them to contract influenza because first of all, they're sick and who wants a sick kid? But we also are very much worried about the complications and including mortality. Now, blessedly, these are pretty rare, but unfortunately, when you have millions of people infected with anything, even a rare complication starts happening at a disturbing frequency. For influenza in children, we talk about pneumonia, either a primary viral pneumonia, which can be very sick, or a secondary bacterial pneumonia because the lungs have been damaged by the influenza virus, uh, middle ear infections and sinusitis. And I think something that is another underrepresented point in the teaching is the exacerbation of other medical conditions. So, you know, if you have high risk children, there should be our first target. If they have underlying lung disease or asthma, we certainly don't want them having to also deal with the burden of influenza. In children, influenza leads to between seven and 27,000 annual hospitalizations, which is a significant loss of work for people. Uh, it's a significant trauma to some of these children and something we definitely want to be avoiding. Now, if you look at just straight mortality statistics, relatively, mortality is rare. 
um, blessedly rare. There's less than 200 deaths per year from influenza. But if you are taking care of one of those 200 children, it's certainly not a rare event. Um, this is a tragedy, and it's a, it's a compounded tragedy when they were not given the opportunity to be afforded some protection because they didn't have an influenza vaccine. The other issue with influenza vaccination is we never know what kind of a flu year we're going to have. So mortality rates and infection rates vary widely depending on how, quote, bad, unquote, the year is. But it's very difficult to know that. Uh, the last few slides here, we'll talk a little bit about some projections of the year based on the Southern Hemisphere. But, but ultimately, we don't know. And we don't know until we're in the middle of it. And that's the same issue with vaccine effectiveness. The vaccine effectiveness you'll see does vary widely. And I think it's something that we don't do a great job communicating. So in general, admittedly, influenza vaccine is about 50% effective. And it's about 50% effective if you use the definition of effectiveness as prevention of clinically evident influenza infection. But it's probably more effective if you look at preventing severe infection, preventing that worsening. So even if it doesn't work 100%, it is helping your patient not wind up in the hospital, not wind up on the ventilator, being sicker, less sick for a shorter amount of time. And I think it's difficult to convey that in a radio commercial or uh, a TV blur blurb, but it is the exact thing that you can do in your one-on-one -on -one counseling. I, I've used uh, the analogy of a, of a life preserver because many of my coworkers will say, I don't wanna take a flu vaccine, it's only 50% effective. And I said, so if you're on a sinking ship and I tell you that this life preserver will work half of the time, do you still want it? Because either way we're going in the water. Right? There's not a 100% vaccine or a 100% life preserver available if you decline this one. Your only choice is something that may work 50-50 or the guarantee that nothing's gonna work because you didn't take it. Um, and, and that's very flippant and maybe I wouldn't say that to all of my patients, but my colleagues can take my sense of humor. This is where we are. I wish we had a 100% effective flu vaccine that we gave once in childhood and never had to repeat ever again. But unfortunately, that's not what we have. So we're working with what we do have, and we need to be able to convince people their benefit in taking it. Next slide. One of those ways is to really realize what influenza is going to look like. Um, I'm hoping that we're not going to see a lot of influenza this year. But if we do, this is what we're going to be seeing. So clinically, in children, influenza incubates for about two days, range of one to four days, and that incubation is clinically silent. Unfortunately, you can become infectious. You can shed virus, you can infect others a day before symptoms start, and you stay infectious for probably about a week, although you're most contagious for the first three to four days. You know, we've had influenza for a long time. We've had time to work out some of these timelines. But if you think about it, these are the exact timelines we're trying to figure out for COVID. You know, how long before you have symptoms could you get somebody sick for COVID? Maybe about two days. How long do you remain infectious? Um, maybe 10 to 14 days. And that's, these are the data that we're first compiling. I think it's very interesting, you know, I, give me a moment of being an ID geek. You know, we're not that used to having brand new infections, brand new viruses that we really don't know a lot about. And I think that one of the things that the public is struggling with is watching medical science evolve in front of their eyes. Uh, because unfortunately, I think we've done a great job in telling people that we know everything and they should just trust us. And a less great job in admitting what we don't know and, and really admitting how science works as a continual trial and error process. Sorry, minute, minute inside my ID key head. So 
now that we've talked about how influenza prevent, presents clinically, I want to talk a little bit about the virus. And if you don't like virology, forget about all of this. But if you look at the bottom uh, left of your screen, that is the nomenclature of naming an influenza virus. And the, where you're going to see that is on the package insert of that vaccine that you're giving. Because we will talk about how we form a committee and guess what virus is to represent in the vaccine. So the nomenclature is we have three types of influenza, A, B, and C. We don't worry about C because it doesn't affect humans. So we have influenza A and B. And there are two major surface proteins, the hemagglutinin and the neuraminidase. And that's the H and the N. And we just number them. H1N1 is type 1 hemagglutinin, type 1 neuraminidase. H3N2 is type 3, type 2. You see how that goes. Um, and then the individual virus is just named where it's found and in what year. So understanding that in the H's and the N's and the antigenic types, you understand how a pandemic can happen. On the next slide, we can talk about what the virus does over time to change. So influenza is with us every year. There are epidemics that sweep the world every year traditionally in the winter months, especially in the extremes of north and south, but actually in the equatorial zone, influenza is a year-round um, low-level infection. Every time the virus replicates, it changes a little bit. The proteins, the H's and the N's change a little bit. They look a little different, and that happens continually year to year. Antigenic drift is the constant. Just think about a boat drifting on the ocean. And that's why we have to tweak the influenza vaccine every year. Antigenic shift is rare and only happens in influenza A. And an antigenic shift is when it reassorts and gets a different hemagglutinin or neuraminidase. So the H or the N number changes. That reassortment um, is almost always with an animal strain and in animals. And usually pigs, unfortunately, are the ones that are most implicated for this. When you shift an H or an N, when you all of a sudden go from H3N2 to H1N7, you are introducing a virus that the human population has not seen and has no pre-existing immunity for. And that's when a major pandemic is poised to happen. So if you are you know, somebody who watches all of the health news, you'll see that there's a different bird flu that was found in ducks in China or in a chicken market in Vietnam. And those are reassortments that we're watching to make sure they don't jump into the human population because if they do, that's the thing that can take off as a pandemic. Next slide. So then once we know how we make the vaccine, when should we give it? And this is now, uh, this is a struggle because you want to time the vaccine to have the maximal efficacy when you think you're going to be most exposed. So you want the peak of vaccine efficacy to hit at the peak of influenza, but we don't know when the peak of influenza is going to be. This has really become more and more of a, an issue as there have been some studies that suggest that vaccine effectiveness drops between five and 10% per month after it's given. Now, those studies are very variable. There's data on both sides uh, of the question, and it really is very variable depending on what is the year, what is the vaccine, how good of a match it was to begin with, but if, you, if you're a pessimist and you think you're gonna lose 10% per month, you really have something that may not be working that well after six months if you only started at a 50% efficacy anyway. So that led some researchers to think maybe we should delay influenza vaccination. But the problem is when you delay, the public health data are very clear that the more you delay, the more you miss. And so this is, this is, we're in a dynamic tension between missing people getting a vaccine to begin with and waiting. So I don't like to wait. I just told you I got mine, you know, September 22nd. Um, and that's because it was literally the first day that our um, employee health was offering it. Certainly, if you're dealing with children who need two injections separated by a month, you must start as soon as possible because the logistics of getting that done are so much uh, higher. 
And then I put in that bullet point about COVID-19 local rates, because I was thinking about the fact of COVID and having to go get this vaccine. And I was thinking about it in the context of my mother, who's in her mid seventies and who was saying, when should I get this vaccine? You know, I don't want it to run out. I don't want, and I said, mom, go now, because the odds that you're going to come in contact with somebody in, and she actually gets it done in the supermarket, in the supermarket, who's going to give you COVID-19 is much lower now, looking at the New Jersey epidemiology, than it may be in a month from now. So take this time to get it done. And I think that is one of the more pressing um, pieces of advice for this year. Get them in now while you still can, because once we get overwhelmed, this is something that's going to fall behind the wayside. Next slide. So if we're going to be honest, we do have to admit that the vaccine effectiveness um, waxes and wanes over the years. And in fact, if you're anti-vaccine, you have memorized that 2014, 2015 had really only a 19% effectiveness. Um, and we get beat up on this. Every time I try to do a talk about vaccination and somebody hates vaccines, they will throw this out. But it's true, so we have to address it. And the issue is sometimes we don't guess well, we don't match up the flu viruses that are actually in circulation with the ones that we have put into the vaccine. And then we also know that our vaccine is much better for H1N1 and type B flu than it is for H3N2. Um, the, for, for various reasons, H3N2 um, influenza virus does not grow as well in eggs and most of these vaccines are made in eggs. And so the, the virus that we get out at the end of it for the vaccine isn't as good. And so the vaccine isn't as effective. Now, if you have a year where there's a high prevalence of H3N2 causing your illnesses, then by definition, your vaccine will look much less effective than if the virus that's causing your illnesses is well represented in the vaccine. So unfortunately, it is what it is, and we don't have um, this year, it may be in a few years we will, but we don't really have the ability to make it better um, so we get what we get. If we look at the, the next slide, you know, this is a better way, I think, to look at the data. What are the benefits of the flu vaccine? And this is just something that CDC put together as a talking point. You know, this is this is what giving flu vaccine has prevented. So we've prevented 4.4 million illnesses. So rather than focus on the vaccine failures, I like to focus on the good that the vaccinations do. And this is something that I would hang up in my clinics. So now let's talk about the actual vaccine for this year. Um, and actually you could just go two slides ahead. So these are the components of this year's vaccine. Um, if you are giving a quadrivalent vaccine, which I'm assuming most of you are giving quadrivalent, which means there's two influenza A's, two influenza B's contained, um, these are the viruses. And these are updates on three out of the four. So there was a lot of study that went into predicting what vaccine, what viruses would circulate this year and growing them in the vaccine to develop the immunity. Now, one of the things that we always want to talk about our patients um, in the counseling, there's a lot of um, disinformation out there that you can get the influenza virus infection from the vaccine. There is only one live viral vaccine, we'll talk about it in a second. Everything else, the viruses are dead is literally impossible for you to contract influenza virus from the vaccine. The viruses are dead. They are not capable of replication. Now, that is not to say that people don't actually get influenza around the time they get the vaccine. So, you know, for being honest, yes, you were in an office and maybe somebody else in there had flu and you caught it from them. It takes about two weeks for this vaccine to take effect and protect you. So if you were exposed a day after you got the shot, it can't help you and you can still get influenza. You can get pretty sick from influenza. What you'll remember is I got sick the day after I got that shot. Human nature is to blame the shot. The shot had nothing to do with it. And I think we need to be able to explain that to our patients. Um, the changes from this year though, suggest that this vaccine will be very important to give 
because they're different enough that we don't expect that our previous shots are going to give us a lot of immunity. On the next slide, anybody who's taking care of kids needs to keep in mind that anyone over the age of six months deserves a flu shot. But if you're less than eight years old and it's your first time getting the vaccine, you deserve two. And this is something that um, we find, you know, when we do retrospective analyses falls out. So you, your first vaccine in order to prime the immune system should be two shots four weeks apart, at least four weeks apart. So you have to keep that in mind. You have to think about your callback system. How are we going to get these children back in? And this is what I was saying about the need to start as early as possible to make sure that we've got both of these doses in. On the next slide, please excuse the use of brand names. Um, I can tell you, I, I literally have no idea what flu vaccine I got yesterday, other than it was quadrivalent. If you, if you said to me, you know, for a million dollars, name the company that made it, I, I can't. Um, but I only put this in, it's copied directly from the CDC guidance, because there is some confusion about the dosing for less than three years old. These are the recommended doses. Um, keep in mind that the uh, the bottom one, it's unlikely that they will make a half dose syringe or a 0.25 milliliter syringe. For all of these vaccines, if even if the 0.25 is the one that is recommended, giving 0.5 milliliters is not a problem. It's permitted in pediatrics. So especially some of us, you know, in our med peds clinic, it's always wait, which which dose are we giving? You know, how old are these patients? Um, it, it is pretty permissive. The the odds, the thing is just get the vaccine in them. On the next slide, I had referenced there is a live attenuated. So when you see the way um, flu vaccines are labeled on the chart, for instance, LAIV stands for live attenuated influenza vaccine. So this is a virus that has been attenuated or mutated. It cannot replicate in your lungs. It actually needs cooler temperatures. So 98.6 kills it. That's why you spray it up the nose. It only replicates in the anterior nose but it replicates enough to give you immunity. Um, most of our clinics honestly don't even have this, so I, I try not to belabor the point. But if you do uh, have this vaccine and you intend to use it, um, and this is the nasal spray vaccine, it's nice because it's not a needle. So for our children um, or adults, because we can use it up to age 49, that don't like needles, it's a, it's a good choice. However, you have to keep in mind some of the contraindications um, and precautions. And in general, most live virus vaccines, you don't want to give to anybody who's pregnant, who has an immune compromising condition. Um, and in this case, also of anybody that has a lung condition because it can exacerbate asthma. So if you are using it, um, I just suggest, because it's a little bit different, take a look at the specific indications and contraindications and plan accordingly. On the next slide, I doubt anybody in, you know, fitting in the maternal child health bill is going to get high dose vaccine, but maybe some of the people that are listening um, want to consider it. So there are a couple of high dose or, or you know, super doses, my mom called it, vaccines. They are indicated for age uh, over 65. And the idea is that there are data that our older patients don't um, admit don't get as high of an immune response to regular dose vaccine. So this is just, as it says, high dose. Um, looking at this, HD stands for high dose. IIV is inactivated influenza vaccine, and they are quadrivalent, so they have all four virus types in them. There's also an adjuvant, A, IIV. Adjuvant is not high dose, but it has an immune stimulator in it. Um, they are not indicated in children. Uh, there are some data I, that I actually keep watching that they may be better in our immune suppressed patients. However, that has not been proven and it's not in the guidelines. So I would say don't worry about that for right now. On the next slide, something you absolutely have to worry about is influenza vaccination in pregnancy. And this, um, you know, I don't have a lot of graphs in here, but this graph really bothers me. We know that influenza disease is very 
very worrisome in pregnancy. Um, we see more severe infections for the mother. It can complicate the pregnancies. Um, there's an increased risk of hospitalization, increased risk of premature delivery. It's, it's very bad. And for this reason, influenza vaccine is universally recommended for maternal health. Um, and if you need any numbers, you know, 40% decrease in the risk of hospitalization is a pretty good number to tout. I also like influenza vaccination for neonatal immunity because remember we can't immunize a child less than six months old. So the only way to get any influenza protection is to, inf is to immunize mom, have mom make anti-influenza antibodies and have her transport those antibodies across the placenta. Now that happens generally uh, to mid, mid to late third trimester, but that can be the little bit of protection that um, that infant or neonate needs to survive a flu challenge. Now, with all of that said, the fact is for season after season after season, our rates of in immunization in pregnant women are hovering around 50%. And that to me is, um, is, is frankly painful. Uh, because this is also a group that we hope is in fairly good contact with the medical community. Um, you know, they're, presumably they are having um, prenatal care visits. And, and every prenatal care visit, in my mind, is a missed opportunity to give an influenza vaccine. So please, please, please take this as a, as a major take-home point. Next slide, you may get some pushback about egg allergy. Um, so most influenza vaccines are made in eggs. So then people that are allergic to eggs are, are very nervous about this. Uh, I personally think it's an overblown allergy. I, I remember when I was doing, um, flu vaccine campaigns for our, one of our affiliate hospitals, I, I had, a, one of our employees, you know, was, was literally yelling at us that they couldn't take influenza vaccine because I, they had an egg allergy. And I said, sir, um, can you put the bacon, egg, and cheese down while you're telling me this? Because I, I'm literally watching you eat an egg. Um, that said, this is guidance directly from uh, CDC out of the MMWR. There are two uh, influenza vaccines that have nothing to do with egg. They're recombinant or cell culture. And those are the two on the first bullet point. It would take some effort, frankly, to find these. Um, but if somebody is very worried, uh, there are um, vaccines that do not involve eggs. Most of these are being given actually at their allergist's office. Otherwise, if you have a history of allergy to egg, you can get the vaccine. If you've had a serious reaction to eggs, the idea is that you should get the vaccine in a monitored setting which doesn't have to be the hospital, but just somewhere that if you started having allergic reactions, there could be an intervention. So that's a medical setting. The only allergy contraindication to influenza vaccine is an allergic reaction to previous influenza vaccine. So we really want to prevent influenza. We really want people to get influenza vaccines. We do not want to make it difficult for them. But remember on the next slide that this is also part of prevention. Um, and this is where I think it's going to be interesting to see what COVID has done, because good COVID prevention is also good flu prevention. So the mask, the hand hygiene, the staying home when you're sick may actually help us this year. On the next slide, hopefully we've done a good job. We've prevented a lot of flu. We don't have to worry about influenza treatment. But um, I think it's, it's good to just review it for a second because you may be getting those phone calls. The vast majority of people that contract influenza actually don't need medical treatment. They don't need drugs. Um, but if we are worried that they will become severely ill through influenza, we do have antiviral medications. Um, these antivirals uh, are most indicated for the high-risk patients, which you'll see listed out there. Um, and I say, you know, for, for purposes of this, anybody under two years old is high risk and certainly should get medicines. Next slide is what medicines? And it's the class, the neuraminidase inhibitors. Um, oseltamivir is the one I'm sure you all know. It has the best pediatric data, um, but there are increasing data for different um, treatments. 
I tend to just still stick with oseltamivir because it's the one that I reliably can find in the pharmacy. Um, because you do want to, if you are going to treat, you want to treat as soon as possible. So this is one where I'll be calling the pharmacy saying, you know, we need to start this on Saturday night um, and not wait for testing. So a quick checking question. Um, and you're all muted, so you can't even answer these, but I'll pretend everybody got the right answer. How do we protect a two-month-old from influenza? We go to the next slide and we see we vaccinate everybody around the two-month-old. Because remember, less than six months old, we can't give them the influenza vaccine. So we cocoon them, one of my favorite pediatric terms, in a, a bubble of people who are not going to acquire and then transmit influenza. So to put on my MedPeds hat for a second, immunization really is a family level healthcare intervention because we want everybody in the household protected. Okay. So now what, what everybody's waiting for, what's going to happen with COVID-19? And the subtitle is nobody knows. And I think that anybody that's telling you they know uh, be careful if they try to start selling you real estate in Florida. But here are some projections, right? <clears throat> what we have seen in the Southern Hemisphere. So remember that our summer is the Southern Hemisphere's winter. So that's when they are supposed to get flu. We've seen um, that you'll see in the next slide, don't go to the next slide yet, sorry, that the flu season has basically been canceled. Uh, for looking at, these are data from the Global Influenza Survey uh, for the Southern Hemisphere. To, to orient you, week 36 started July 31st, 2020. That's the far right of this um, picture. And they have not had flu. So on the next slide, it was famously said that the flu season was canceled. So no region in the Southern Hemisphere had more than 10% uh, flu. And that is very, very different than the last multiple years. So why did that happen? Well, you could say if you're a pessimist that there was flu, we just missed it because everybody was focusing on COVID. Nobody was testing for flu, they were just looking for COVID. People were so afraid to go to the doctor, they just stayed home with the flu. They didn't even you know, present for medical attention so they couldn't get diagnosed. Um, but I don't think that that's true. And I think that for a lot of reasons, that's not true because people were, and the healthcare system was so attuned to looking for COVID and you can't distinguish COVID for influenza that you would have found these patients. You could say that maybe there was more vaccination and certainly data from New Zealand would bear this out where they had 40% increase in their influenza vaccine. Um, so maybe more vaccination helped abort the flu epidemic this year. And if that's the case, awesome. And that should be our selling point for every year. Um, but what I think probably happened is that the COVID-19 prevention behaviors are really respiratory viral prevention behaviors. So if you're locked down, if you're minimizing your exposure to others, and when you are exposing yourself to others, it's not in close congregate settings, you are wearing a mask, you're eating outside instead of inside, all of these things are probably protecting you from influenza too. So the Southern Hemisphere really did skate by so far without seeing influenza. And on the next slide, you know, just to think that, you know, it's not just New Zealand, the red line there is Australia. There's basically no appreciable influenza on the continent of Australia, uh, which I think is, is pretty amazing. The next slide, I. I do think social distancing has done a, a great service. And this is um, data from Finnish children's hospitals. So Finland, you know, had a bit earlier COVID outbreak than we did. And they went into a national lockdown and they looked at ER visits for respiratory illnesses before and after the national lockdown. So 2019, the red lines, are um, pre-COVID, obviously, 2020 was the national lockdown. And you see all influenza RSV was shortened. And so by locking down for COVID, they stopped all of their respiratory viral infections. 
Um, obviously not all, but a, but a great deal. So maybe on the next slide, that's what we'll see. Wouldn't it be great if all of this worked and we didn't see COVID and we didn't see influenza and we didn't see RSV? And, and I would be the happiest person on this call if that were to happen. But I've trained in ID and I'm a pessimist by training. I think we all kind of are. And I keep saying without, you know, hint of political sarcasm, you know, we don't look that much like New Zealand in our national actions. Um, we haven't done as nearly as well with COVID-19 as these other countries to whom I was just comparing us. So I don't think that's what we're going to see. And certainly I, in my medical centers, that's not what we're prepare, preparing for. So if that's not what we're gonna see, you all, and that's why you're here, have to be champions of vaccination. So if you could advance two slides. I cannot stress enough the importance of normalizing vaccination as a primary care intervention. Um, this needs to be as easy as possible. I was fascinated by this study in New England Journal. This looked at over a million children who were between two and five years old, and it looked at the odds that they got an influenza vaccine. And that, that's the chart on the right. But to give you the, the um, punchline is if you had your birthday during influenza vaccine season, you were significantly more likely to be given an influenza vaccine. Between, if you were between the ages of two and five. And that's because health-seeking behaviors, your, your checkup was around your birthday. And if you came for your checkup, your provider appropriately said, oh, and you need the flu vaccine. But if you're like me with a July birthday and you went in July and there was no vaccine, it just exposes that we don't have a good mechanism to call me back in and say, although you did your physical in July, you need to come back in in September, October to get this vaccine. That difference fell apart and in the older ages, and that was attributable to the fact that they are less likely to come in for a yearly checkup. And so I look at this and I say, this is the importance of that regular you know, medical home and, and scheduling all of those visits. So on the next slide, we'll take a second to talk about vaccine hesitancy because it's real and it is absolutely real with influenza vaccine. So this is a 2019 survey, families with children looking at vaccine hesitancy on a five point Likert scale. 6% were hesitant about routine vaccines, but over a quarter were about influenza vaccines. They were worried about side effects, but if you look at the next slide, what they were really worried about in the difference between influenza and the other vaccines is they didn't think that influenza vaccines worked. So the importance of getting them and the belief that they worked were influencing their decision. And I think this actually makes sense. This actually means that they're doing the right thing. They're just calculating it wrong. And, and so what do I mean by that? If we're truly getting informed consent, then we need to really do a risk benefit calculation. What are the risks of this vaccine? What are the benefits? Because I would be the first to tell you that the risks are not zero. They're very, very low, but they're not zero. Now, the problem is that if you believe that the vaccine is worthless, then your risk becomes a much bigger deal because you're not offsetting it with benefit. But if you believe that the vaccine has benefit, now you can justify that risk. So I think that the families are doing a risk benefit analysis. I think that we're just not giving them enough data that show that the benefit is real and that the risk is very small. If I'm right, then with the proper access to information and guidance, they will make the right choice because they're motivated to make the right choice. The problem with guidance is if you go on, you know, Google or any web browser and put in vaccine, 
you will be overwhelmed with anti-vaccine literature. Um, conspiracy theories, uh, and, and some of these, honestly, I gotta tell you, are good. I can get three clicks in before I realize, wait a minute, this, this, th am I not on the NIH site? What's happening here? Um, you know, when it gets really kind of crazy. But what we are not good at as a medical establishment is countering that. You know, our voice is not as loud. There aren't as many celebrities saying you should get a vaccine. So we all need to prepare to be able to have these conversations. And then on what is my final slide, you know, I, I think this is a good way to prepare, but you all have your own styles. Uh, this was written in 2012 and I think it, it rings true to this day. This is actually one of the, one of the teaching papers that I use for our trainees on vaccine counseling. Um, but you, you, I'm sure you all know this because it's, every part of counseling for any anything in health um, promotion. You need buy-in. You need to be able to discuss something without drawing uh, or without putting up a wall between you and the patient. So I think that what we need to do is be very humble and honest. You know, this is what we know. These are things that we don't know. That is going to be incredibly important at whatever point we start talking about giving a COVID-19 vaccine. We need to be able to honestly show data and talk about safety and efficacy and admit when it's not as effective as we want. But we need to be able to give our own opinions that are true to us of how we look at the risk and the benefit. And I think if we do that, most of our patients are still talking to us and coming to us because they do trust us and they do want our opinions. They just want true facts. So I, I hope that you know this will prompt you to look at the CDC website on vaccine hesitancy. There's some great patient handouts, um, not just about influenza vaccine, but about every every different vaccine and really sit down and have that discussion and work through um, the resistance. And it may not even be in the first visit, but if you continue working at it, data show again and again that the vast majority of patients and families will eventually choose um, the vaccine if given the right amount of uh, information and patient persistent counseling. So, that was all I had. I think we probably have a few minutes. I'm hoping for questions. That's that's what we were shooting for at least. Um, and if anybody you know comes up with questions after this, please feel free to email me. Um, I will try to try to get back to you as soon as possible. Um, and uh, thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Dr. Sanimo. That was a great presentation. Um, on flu. And if you have, uh, if anyone has questions for Dr. Sinemo, you can put them in the question box and we'll make sure that he can um, have a chance to address those. Um, one question that uh, is, is coming up is um, in regards to the antivirals um, medications mm -hmm. for flu um, for children. You know, one of the one of the reasons that we hear from parents that they don't want to give those to children is the side effects, and yeah. um, especially you know um, you hear you know the side effects could be um, hallucinations, yeah. um, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and so if you if you have a child with relatively mild flu illness uh, under the age of two, let's say, put them in a high risk category. And the doctor prescribes antivirals, uh, but they say, you know, your one and a half year old may experience hallucinations and nausea, vomiting, diarrhea as a side effect of this. It's a little troubling to give, right. you know, to your child. So, how, how do you kind of balance that with parents' concerns? Um, so, I, I so I, I first balance. I actually agree with the parents a lot. Um, you know, I. I can't say off the record, but my kind of off the record opinion is we pro we do we over prescribe um, uh, these these medications. Now, 
I think though, and I love, by the way, the scenario you just gave. So I think that we, we do have to balance it by understanding the risks. So one, you know, under two years old is a very high risk and that's why you picked it. So mild flu right now may not be mild tomorrow. Um, and, and I worry about that. And especially you worry about that if we're, you know, hours to days into this as opposed to a week into it. Um, so, you know, I say this is, this is high risk. Um, you know, your, your one and a half year old is very different than your 15 year old with mild flu. The other thing is that, um, especially the hallucination psychosis, uh, scariness is something that was definitely seen. It's actually most commonly seen, it, it was most commonly seen in Japan and does seem to be uh, unfortunately more prevalent in patients of Asian descent. It was seen more in older children, teenagers. So not that, not that a hallucinating 18 month old is a good thing, but um, because one of the things that we were worried about was actually suicidality. Um, that you still have much less risk of that at 18 months. So I, th I would do a real risk benefit discussion. Um, and I think we also have to look at what are the individual child's risk factors. Uh, but, but I, I agree with you. It's, it's very scary if you go and um, look up, you know, the medications on your own and you read some of these side effects. So I often will tell the family, look, um, I know you're gonna go look this up, so let's just say it right now. Uh, yes, these are the things, but they are very rare. And the, rare, the rarity or scarcity of the negative effect, you know, your child is actually in a pretty high risk group. I think we have to um, try the medications. Thank you. Uh, we have a lot of great questions coming in, so we'll try and get to them all. Um, someone was asking, um, do you have to wait between a, getting a flu shot and a potential COVID vaccine? Would they be allowed to be given together? I'm not sure that we know this yet, but if you yeah, have any insight. So it's, that's a fabulous question. We, we don't know. Um, it's going to be very interesting. Um, I, I, right now you can get a, a flu vaccine with any other vaccine. Um, it's unlikely that that should be different for COVID. However, I can imagine a scenario, uh, especially if the COVID vaccine is released in any way under an EUA, um, an emergency use authorization, that they may suggest that. And that's purely because we will want to collect as, most, as much data on the COVID vaccine being used as possible. And we wouldn't want to confound that by saying, well, could the problem have been with the flu vaccine? So if you imagine getting both vaccines together and then that night you have 101 fever, which one do we attribute it to? Um, I, but I don't know what the FDA is gonna do with that. Um, it, that, to plug early flu vaccine though, one of the reasons to just get the vaccination off the table now for the one that we know we have. Right. And I'd, I'd like to plug too, I got my flu shot last week, uh, last Thursday. So I'm, I'm in the camp of gotten it. I've received it early too. <laughs> um, okay. So Dr. Rubenstein from St. Joseph's Hospital and Medical Center uh, in Arizona uh, said, thank you for this great lecture. Can you please comment on the disparity issues associated with vaccine hesitancy and compliance? Um. Sure. And, and Drew, you definitely need one because it's going to hit Arizona before it hits New Jersey. Um, so there, there's a few different, I mean, there, I, I'm, I'm wondering actually even which disparity you're referring to, but so certainly there's, there's the disparities in vaccination that we all um, know of as, as all healthcare disparities, which is unfortunately underserved patients tend to be globally underserved and, and vaccination is uh, certainly one of those things. You know, New Jersey's, in my opinion, really good about getting vaccines out to underserved people, but we need to make sure that we are engaging them in care. So you can, you know, for instance, we use a lot of VFC um, in our, our resident-based clinic 
in New Jersey, but if you don't come in, if you're not a regular patient, then then you're, that's lost to you. Um, there's a there's a oft repeated and probably not the most um, scientific study that um, looked at vaccine hesitancy, and they said uh, they they basically they mapped vaccine hesitancy or under vaccination um, and various things and. The joke is that the two most predictive factors for being under, having an area with under vaccine or under vaccination were Tesla charging stations and Whole Foods. Um, so sort of the, the the antithesis of traditional disparities. But we know that there are um, there are pockets of great vaccine resistance. Um, they tend to be, unfortunately, in uh, otherwise higher socioeconomic uh, areas, higher education areas. And, um, you know, this is where I probably get too political or, or politically incorrect. You know, it's the, it's the I've done my internet research phenotype. Um, that, those data have very much translated, uh, especially in the state of California, to areas with a lot of vaccine exemption, and then you can map them on top of outbreaks. Uh, and measles was the one that taught us the most about that in, in recent memory. So, you know, you do have the, the phenotype of, you know, hesitancy. Um, and it's, it's distrust in government, it is distrust in experts, but it's also, and sometimes separately, this idea of natural, um, organic. And if you are dealing um, in communities that have this, I think your efforts really need to be redoubled because it is known and predicted that those will be the areas, uh, because you've lost herd immunity, that have the biggest outbreaks. So I think, unfortunately, you need to know sort of the epidemiology of why you have vaccine hesitancy or low rates, and it's it's a very different education campaign because it's not one of availability and access, it's one of counteracting the disinformation. Um, and I think in the middle of COVID-19, that's gotten a lot harder uh, because I used to just quote the CDC as the gold standard, and unfortunately in recent, um, difficulties, shall we say, that they've had, uh, you know, I, I'm having more trouble with that because people are, you know, pushing back, well, how do you know that that's true? Uh, and it is, it's a continual discussion. Thank you. Um, another question is, what is your opinion regarding mandating flu vaccines by employers for uh, organizations such as public health organizations? Uh, so, I mean, so it's my so you're asking an opinion question. So it's my personal opinion. I um, I I'm very strongly in favor of mandates. Uh, I've worked through two uh, healthcare systems, being intimately involved in their infection control and uh, vaccination programs, and uh, both in New Jersey, and and neither one can we uh, really get anywhere near the you know, over 90% influenza vaccine um, that is a JACO standard without mandates. Um, I, I, all, you know, personal, uh, let's see, personal liberties arguments aside, I, I use the argument of you, you chose to be in healthcare. And so this is now part of your responsibility um, to be as a healthcare provider to, do whatever you can to prevent you infecting your patients. Um, and that that's my just personal take on it. And if you've ever worked with me, you've heard me argue that in meetings. Okay, and another question, is the intranasal flu vaccine, the live attenuated, um, available this year? Uh, it, as far as I know, it should be. Frankly, I've not seen it. Um, we we chose not to purchase it here, but as far as I I have not 
been informed of any you know great shortages of it um, there was a bit of maybe you're referring to there was a bit of a time where it was pulled um, because it was felt to be less effective but when those data were really um, analyzed it was uh, it, it just happened to be a bad uh, efficacy or effectiveness year in general and um, it was no it wasn't doing any worse than the injections okay and going back to uh, the maternal immunizations for pregnant women getting their flu vaccine, uh, for, T, for pertussis vaccine, it's recommended in the third trimester. And you mentioned the anti antibody uh, transfer happens in the later third trimester. However, flu vaccine is recommended at any point during... Um, pregnancy during flu season. So is there an ideal time during pregnancy to get vaccinated for flu for that maternal transmission? So, so the true answer is we don't know. Um, at least I don't know, because I've never seen, you know, this, the, the study that you're really talking about is, you know, really has never been done to my knowledge. It's immunized women at different times in their pregnancies, look at their antibody levels, look at their baby as antibody levels, see what worked well. Um, and we don't, we don't really know. Um, certainly the antibody transfer happens based on what mom's antibody levels are. So it's, you know, for instance, uh, measles, mumps, rubella antibodies are being transferred and she didn't, she last got that vaccine when she was four years old. So that's not a particular worry. I think that this question really needs to be driven um, by her risk. And so we do not want her to develop the actual infection during her, well, at all, but during her pregnancy. And so superseding the idea of maximizing the antibodies to the baby has to be her protection because that that infection is going to potentially adversely affect the pregnancy. So I would still give it to her as soon as I could because I don't want her getting sick herself. Right, right. And we know fevers during, uh, high fevers right. during pregnancy are, are a concern, so, uh, which could happen with flu or COVID-19, so. Exactly. Okay, so that um, we're we're gonna wrap up the questions portion of our um, of Dr. Sanimo's presentation right now. Thank you so much. It was really helpful. We have a lot of great comments um, that it was an excellent presentation, and thanking you so much for thank you. for giving it. So we really well, appreciate it. Thank you all it. for listening. Yes, thank you. So I'll turn it back over to uh, Dr. Schwab to uh, start the uh, coalition portion of our meeting. Okay, thanks, Emily. And again, thank you, David. That was a great presentation and um, uh, really, we appreciate it. Um, so the next item on our agenda is uh, the approval of the minutes. So those were distributed by email with the invitation. If um, we can take, um, after you've had a chance to review them, if you haven't already, um, we can also take a, a motion to approve them over the chat. Um, if there are any corrections, please send them also over by chat as well. Thank you. And um, you can just go ahead and type in the chat box and, and we'll move on. I'll monitor that uh, for, the, for the remainder of the meeting if someone has a motion to approve. Um, and then I also just wanted to mention too, for those of you uh, looking to get uh, nursing credit for Dr. Sinimo's uh, presentation, we will be sending out a program evaluation. So um, please be look on the lookout for an email that has a program evaluation. When you fill that out um, and return it, we will um, send you your certificate. So just to give you an update on that. So uh, Dr. Schwab, you can go ahead and um, introduce Daria. Yes, yeah, so I just, uh, the next item on the agenda is uh, something you probably have heard a little bit about already, and I'm really happy to introduce Daria McClam, who's our newly recruited program direct coordinator for the New Jersey Influenza Action Group. 
um, which is the result of a successful grant application. So we have funding to increase influenza immunization uh, through uh, direct education of the community. And so I'd like to invite Daria to present the program to us um, at this time. Thank you. Um, I first want to just say uh, that was a great presentation by Dr. Sinemo, um, and it will help us go into the uh, more about the initiative that the partnership is hosting. Uh, so we are going to talk about the New Jersey Influenza Action, Action Group that the partnership is hosting this flu season. So the Action Group, uh, is the partnership was awarded a grant from the Department of Health to develop and implement a statewide flu vaccination campaign for this upcoming flu season. Um, especially with the COVID-19 pandemic, it continues to have a tremendous impact on our state. Um, and there's a concern that we will be straining our healthcare system again. Uh, once flu comes around this season. So to help address this concern, we have developed an action group um, and it's full of members from various organizations all over the state of New Jersey. So this action action group, it's, it'll, it'll have different members inside of, um, from various organizations within New Jersey and you uh, will be able to access the influenza digital toolkit. So we are in the process of creating um, some social media shareables. It'll be um, in different languages. I believe we have six or seven languages being prepared for our toolkit. Um, and it'll, it'll have uh, information about the flu, uh, the some flu facts, um, specific um, demographic information regarding flu disparities. Um, so all of that information will be available in our toolkit and you'll be able to use that um, to share on your, your profiles, your social media profiles and to your clients. And um, the, you also have an invitation to visit uh, our virtual action group meetings. So our first kickoff event will be on October 7th. Uh, we are hosting uh, it virtually. And if you are able to attend and you wanna join the action group, uh, you can definitely reach out to me. Um, my email will be in the last slide. Um, and then part of the action group, you will also be recognized on our influenza campaign website. It is currently being um, built. Um, you are able to access it now. Uh, it should be fully launched by the end of this month, um, and you'll be able to use that, that uh, the toolkit and the shareables. And the action group will also um, allow you to network with other organizations and businesses, which is also very important um, and also a plus. And uh, next slide, please. So currently the action group consists of um, Currently 80 organizations, we have 93 individual members. We are continually growing. We currently have member organizations from local health departments, a lot of college and, college and universities. Um, we have the New Jersey chapter, American College OBGYN, um, the OBGYN Society of New Jersey. So very um, various organizations from across the state. Uh, and we are encouraging others to join this action group because we are better in number and we are greater in number. Next slide. So like I said, we do um, still need your help. We encourage other organizations to join and reach out um, to join this action group. Again, the responsibility would just be to um, post on your social media, um, pages about the influenza and the importance of getting vaccinated for the flu. Um, and our slogan is the power to protect New Jersey. So we have the power to protect New Jersey together and we encourage you to um, join this action group and join this initiative um, so that we can protect more New Jersey um, citizens and just have the everyone protected against the flu this season. So if you have any questions, feel free to email me. My email is on the screen, New Jersey Flu Action at partnershipmch.org. Um, if you want to learn more about the action group, feel free to email me as well. Thank you. And Dari, can you um, say more about what the action group kickoff meeting will be like on October 7th? Yeah, the agenda. no problem. So on, yeah. Um, so the action group kickoff meeting is on October 7th. Um, it's from 1 to 2 p.m. and we will be having um, two guest speakers present on um, they're from Families Fighting um, Flu, Cerise and Jennifer Miller. 
um, they will be presenting on um, the on flu and Jennifer Miller, who is actually a New Jersey parent, she um, her daughter actually had flu a couple years ago, and so she will be um, going over her experience and um, you know her daughter uh, gratefully survived. So she will be going um, to talk about that topic, and we will also have um, Monica Smith from the partnership. She will be going over the social media toolkit. Um, how to use it and just introducing it to the action group members. So it'll be an eventful um, virtual event and um, we encourage you to attend and um, join the action group. Great, thanks, Saria. And I also just want to mention too, as part of this campaign, there's a wider um, advertising component as well. So we're working closely with the State Department of Health uh, we do have some billboards up on the turnpike already, and, and we'll be rolling those out throughout the state um, this flu season. And we also have a, a pretty large digital and print ad campaign that we'll be covering the state. Uh, we're targeting different populations across different platforms. And the social media shareables that um, are part of the toolkit that Daria mentioned will be available in five languages and do um, target different groups. So we have uh, social media shareables that target young adults specifically, or students, um, caregivers, pregnant women, um, parents of young children, families. And uh, so, you know, that, depending on the population that you're serving, um, this, th this is really um, a helpful resource so that you don't have to recreate the wheel. So if you have any questions, you can go ahead and put them in the question box and we'll address them. And then right now we'll move on to the working group updates. Okay, so um, Kendra Julian is our adolescent immunization specialist at the Partnership for Maternal and Child Health. And um, Kendra, can you go ahead and, and start your working group update for community education? Sure. So hi, everyone. Um, as Emily mentioned, my name is Kendra Julian. Um, and I'm the Adolescent Immunization Specialist. Um, and I will just give you a quick overview about um, our education working group call. But before I do so, um, the purpose of the education working group call is basically to discuss um, immunization education opportunities and also to discuss any future immunization education events. So um, on our call, um, uh, due to COVID, the education working group uh, suggested hosting a virtual health fair. Usually, we normally would host an a in-person health fair. Um, but of course, because of COVID, we decided to do um, it virtually. Um, and so the virtual resource fair took place on August 26. Um, there were about five panelists that participated. Um, each panelist gave a 10 to 15 minute presentation and shared resources about flu and the vaccine. So as you can see here, um, we had Jennifer Smith from New Jersey Department of Health. Um, she gave an overview of the importance of flu prevention and she also shared some resources. Um, we also had um, Iris Cooney from Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield. <clears throat> Excuse me. She gave a brief overview on how you can pay for flu vaccine. We also had um, Velda Font Morris. Um, she shared information about the School Bus Express program and discussed the extended hours North Department of Health is offering. Um, we had Michael Pedro from Walgreens Pharmacy. Um, he also shared some when or where Walgreens uh, Pharmacy would be administering flu shots. And then lastly, we had Dr. Shwati Bengaria from University Hospital, and she shared information about flu um, in pediatric and the importance of getting the flu vaccine. So, um, there is a recording available on YouTube. Um, you know, of course, um, you can definitely check it out there. Um, and also please share with your colleagues 
um, or your clients, um, the information that they provided that day was extremely helpful and valuable. Okay, um, also um, during this time of the year, I would normally um, outreach the schools, collaborate with the universities and the colleges, um, do some, and do some tabling events. Um, but obviously, again, due to COVID, um, this year we're doing things differently um, and I'm outreaching, this, outreaching to the schools um, in regards to flu and HPV. And so I'm distributing bags with education and materials about getting vaccinated for flu and HPV. So if you um, have some kind of connections with any of the colleges or the, or the universities, um, and you feel like this will be helpful for your university, please you know, definitely reach out to me and I can put some bag, bags available for you. So over the summer, um, my colleague Melinda Garcia and I created a HPV webinar for parents, um, what parents should know about adolescent vaccine. Um, we hosted this webinar on July 29th. The video is recorded and can be found on YouTube as well. And so the purpose of the webinar is to educate parents about the importance of adolescent vaccines. Um, oftentimes we do have a lot of parents that are concerned about the vaccines. Um, uh, for their for their adolescents. So again, this um, webinar can be found on YouTube. Um, if you have clients or family members, um, you know, that have questions about the, the adolescent vaccines, um, this is a definitely a great webinar um, to check out. And then lastly, the partnership has a library of professional webinars that are offering professional credits on a variety of health topics. Um, there are also recorded webinars that are on demand, and you can find these webinars on the partnership website. Um, so again, um, please share this information with your colleagues, your clients, family members, or friends. Um, the next call will be held in October. The calls normally takes place uh, twice for the quarter. Um, if you are interested um, in joining the um, one of our calls, please let me or Emily know and I can add you to the next working group. Um, uh, I can add you to our, our uh, email list. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Kendra. And I do just want to um, put a plug in for the uh, webinar for parents that Kendra mentioned on adolescent vaccines. We are actually running that webinar tomorrow as well in Spanish. So tomorrow's webinar will be completely in Spanish and that will be recorded as well and available on the YouTube channel if you have um, parents with adolescents who are Spanish speaking. Okay, and I see our minutes are approved. We have a motion to approve, so thank you. I'll move on to, whoops. Let's see. Move on to our community engagement working group updates. So uh, we've been, uh, the community engagement working group has been meeting uh, once per quarter and uh, we've been focusing on the goals for the coalition that have been set this year. So uh, those three goals have been increasing maternal immunization awareness, combating vaccine hesitancy, and um, improving and increasing our EMIC membership and social media following. So um, uh, the engagement working group, since our last coalition meeting, has developed a lot of great resources uh, with funding from the New Jersey Department of Health Vaccine Preventable Disease Program. So we do have two videos available on maternal immunizations. And Dr. Sanimo talked about the importance of flu vaccine during pregnancy. And uh, flu and pertussis vaccines are very important. So we developed some graphic videos. One is in English and one is in Spanish. And they're both about a minute and a half long. So they're great for um, promoting through social media. They're, they're closed captioned. And they also um, would be great to share on a patient portal if you work with pregnant women um, or to put out through, um, you know, if, it, if there are waiting rooms that are uh, able to show videos while people wait. Although right now with COVID-19 precautions, we hope that people aren't waiting too long in waiting rooms um, for their appointments. But you know, this is a new resource that you can share with, with pregnant women to help address concerns. 
And then we also received funding from GSK to uh, implement a maternal influenza and pertussis patient education project. So we just started with that project. It is an unrestricted educational grant. So we will not, um, GSK will not have any input in the content or development of materials. We will be hosting three focus groups in two weeks to um, start that process. So the three focus groups will, the objective of those groups is to um, get information from pregnant women and new mothers with children under the age of one about what messaging they heard during their pregnancy about flu and pertussis vaccines, and also what messaging really resonates with them and any concerns they have about receiving vaccines during pregnancy. And then the, so we'll do one focus group in English and one focus group in um, Spanish, and those will be held on October 6th and 7th. So we have the flyers for those if you work with pregnant women who you think would be eligible, we are giving a $25 gift card incentive for participants. So um, please email me if, if you'd like to um, share that information or you think you have moms that are interested. And then on October 6th from 12 to 1 p.m., we will be hosting a focus group for nurses, advanced practice nurses and uh, nurse midwives who work with pregnant women. Um, to also hear about the, their experience in talking about vaccines with pregnant women. And for those focus groups, we're offering a $50 um, in gift card incentive for participation. We do have a few people signed up already, and it's going to be filled on a first-come, first-served basis. So if you fall into that category and you're interested, please email me so I can get you signed up. And then after we complete those focus groups, we'll be um, going forward with developing materials in English and Spanish for promoting flu and pertussis vaccines to pregnant women. And this project is in uh, collaboration with Families Fighting Flu. So we're working with them to um, you know, come up with the content, get the messaging and distribution, and then we'll also be uh, doing a kickoff in the first week in December to um, provide those materials to organizations to share with pregnant women. We also uh, have developed several videos. I think we have about 20 videos up on our YouTube channel now, combating common vaccine myths. So in, in order to address vaccine hesitancy, we had several uh, EMIC members from different backgrounds participate in this project, and those are all about um, 45 seconds or less uh, in length, and they're perfect for social media. They are captioned, and they also, um, some of the videos are done in Spanish as well. So, you know, some, some of them address flu, but mostly they're general vaccine hesitancy questions. And, um, Again, that project was funded through the New Jersey Department of Health Vaccine Preventable Disease Program. And then just an update on our EMIC membership. We have been increasing our social media following um, pretty dramatically this um, quarter. So our Instagram, especially our Instagram account, saw a big jump. So if you aren't already following us on social media, I encourage you to follow us so you can see the content that we're putting out and sharing. We have over 300 newsletter subscribers and over 110 active members as of right now in the coalition. So that's kind of an update on what the working group has been doing. And just a reminder, we have this resource um, for Essex County vaccine clinics. Um, I encourage you if you're looking for um, places to go to get vaccinated. Um, these are all, all great resources. And Velda Font Morris from the Newark Department of Health and Community Wellness oversees their immunization program and their VFC clinic. So I encourage you to get in touch with her as well um, to see if you're interested in setting up a, an on-site clinic um, in schools or um, in other areas in the Newark area. 
So now we'll move on. Um, we have just a few minutes. If anyone has questions, you can put them in the question box. Um, we're also interested to see if any of our coalition partners have updates that they'd like to share or resources that they want to make sure um, get sent out to our coalition members. So I'll give a, a couple of minutes just to put in the chat box if you have any updates to share um, or questions for the coalition members. Okay, so Dr. Schwab, I'm not seeing any updates right now, but if you wanna go ahead and um, start closing the meeting, I'll let you know if anything comes in to share. Oh, wait, actually we have one. Um, as Ni Sharp, the co-chair for um, the coalition, said that COVID-19 testing is now available at Bessie May Women and Family Health Center at 280, South Harrison Street in East Orange. Thank you, Esni. Okay, thanks, Emily. And if um, any other updates or announcements come out, I think we can um, get those out to the membership electronically by email or on our next newsletter as well. So feel free to send those in as they come up. Um, so I did want to thank everybody for joining us today. Um, I think it was a very productive meeting and some good information for us to get started with the flu season. And so uh, I'd just like to encourage everyone to keep up the good work. And um, we're looking forward to meeting again at our next quarterly meeting in December. Um, and we'll be in touch with you about that um, in, the, in the near future. So. Thanks, Dr. Schwab. We did have one other update come in from Maureen Kuhn at American Cancer Society. She says, please let everyone know that the American Cancer Society has updated, updated our cervical cancer screening guidelines, as well as our HPV vaccination guidelines starting at age nine years old. Thank you, Maureen. And if you send updates, we can distribute those to the coalition. Okay, so... Um, I think that's all the updates. Dr. Shrive, you can go ahead and um, close the meeting. Yeah, so, well, I guess we officially closed the meeting. Uh, thank you again, everybody, for attending. Stay well, and we look forward to being in touch again very soon. Take care. Thank you.